like to uh, keep up with the local chamber. It's a fan fantastic sounding board. Uh, and I want to continue doing that. Uh, I mean, I've only been back in Parliament for a, a few weeks, uh, and I've given priority to uh, getting around all the local schools. I've got around about half of them so far, uh, and the hospitals and the police. And we are going to be faced probably in 18 months' time with a pretty, no, not a very good deal, and more likely the risk of just crashing out of the whole thing without any kind of legal alternative being developed. And that's the point at which I and my people will argue that, for goodness sake, we've got to have an exit from Brexit. You know, there has to be a way of dealing with this more sensibly than just charging on and running over a cliff and hoping we're caught by a tree on the way down, which is, I think, the current thinking. Um, and so that's why we would argue that at that point, if you get a bad deal or no deal, uh, we've got to open the thing up again to a public and I, th I think the full understanding of this is only just beginning to dawn on people. And it came last week when we started talking about Euratom, which is just in a way one tiny little corner of the problem. Um, Euratom is a kind of fantastically useful uh, agency that deals with nuclear research, you know, isotopes for cancer, a lot of things. But because it's subject to the European Court of Justice uh, legal procedures, the government said we can't have it. So this very complex set of arrangements is going to have to be renegotiated from scratch, new, new bureaucracies established to run it, new sets of laws and so on. And we now realize that that's only about 1% of what will have to happen. And somebody pointed out in Parliament this week, just look at civil aviation. Right? About 10 different sets of laws, regulation around passenger safety, fueling, ticketing, landing rights, all of which will have to be regulated again from scratch. So my first priority is to make absolutely sure we do not leave this single market because of the horrendous costs that will be involved in doing so. Then to stay within the customs union because all our supply chain industries uh, depend on it for their business models, uh, to stay within the collaborative research, <coughs> which is fundamental to universities and institutions like NPL, uh, and to keep the common approach to sort of global environmental and security. Now, my third point really follows on from that. What I want to do um, is to major on economic and business issues. Because that's the world I do understand something about. Um, and I think what is alarming and rather shocking at the moment is that those issues, for the first time in my lifetime, really are not up there as a matter of priority. Um, if you go back to, uh, you know, a few years, I used to joust with people like uh, George Osborne, Ken Clark, Ed Balls, uh, Gordon Brown. I mean, you may or may not like them, they may not be your tribe. But nonetheless, there were serious people who did understand the importance of numbers, who understood that economic competence mattered, because economic competence gives business confidence, and business confidence gives decent economic performance, which gives more money for health and all these other things. But at the moment, these things have been relegated to the third division. They're not considered to be important. And parties went into the last election without any numbers, or numbers that didn't add up, and it wasn't thought to matter. Uh, the whole issue about how you tackle productivity, which is fundamental, because unless productivity goes up, you don't have wages going up and living standards stagnate or decline. You know, that word hardly featured in the campaign. So one of my central tasks is to get the whole economic agenda uh, around you know, long-term productivity, having sensible approach to budgets, but actually back at the centre of the political debate. So if I can achieve those three things, uh, making uh, I and my team uh, filling that big hole in the middle, having a sensible approach to Brexit, and restoring the importance of the arguments around business and the economy, I think we will have achieved something. OK, thank, thank you.
you know, we are a neutral organisation. We have councillors from both, uh, just for new people who are not here, who haven't been here before, I mean. We are a neutral organisation. So do you have any questions? Whatever they are, please feel free. Val Farm and Mind, you know. Um, so it's completely unrelated to the charity that I work for, but I'm very interested to know what your approach would be to increase manufacturing again in Britain, because you're talking about productivity, the manufacturing side of things is just declined. Well, one of the things I tried to do in my five years in government was to try to rebuild um, British manufacturing as far as possible. Uh, it has declined precipitately. Not, it's, 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 nothing, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, almost all developed countries have seen their manufacturing sector decline precipitately. In the UK, it's now about 10 or 11 percent of GDP, which is about the same as France and the United States. It's, but it's much lower than Germany and Japan. And I think it's probably declined too far. Um, it's also not totally clear what manufacturing means these days. I mean, if you're talking about advanced internet platforms, you know, what's manufacturing, what services, that old kind of concepts have sort of disappeared. But one of the things we did do, uh, and I worked very hard on, was the creation of what we call an industrial strategy, which was to try and help uh, encourage investment in the car industry, the aerospace industry, life sciences. We had a pretty good success rate. Uh, what worries me at the moment is because of all the uncertainty around Brexit, investment is stalled. I mean, if you look at the car industry, there's a bit of investment going into Honda, but all of the others have just stopped. They're just waiting to see what happens. And if the customs union is lost and you get an inspection system for widgets going backwards and across, across front, they will, they will simply go. I mean, they won't just march out, but they'll just gradually allow their British operations to decline. And you've seen this already in the car industry. Investment, uh, there was a report last Monday. Investment's down three quarters in that industry. Uh, output's down about 10%. And the same it will be true in aerospace because Airbus will not stay here if they feel their um, <coughs> supply chains around wings are going to be destroyed. I mean, they just walk. Uh, and so, so the future of manufacturing, or at least advanced manufacturing, which is what matters, and things like food production, which are very high tech in the UK. I mean, a lot of this now hinges around whether we stay in the single market in the customs okay. union. It, it, of course, patents are important, particularly in industry. Copyright is probably more important if you're dealing in the service sector. And we just got to the point of getting a common approach to copyright through a digital single market. And the British have been pushing that very hard. And all that presumably will now go. Um, yeah, I mean, th these are subtle but important issues. I, th I think, you know, we, we have skill shortages in many areas, but the two big areas are engineering, because a lot of blue-collar engineering workers, highly skilled workers, are now 50-plus, and many of them are retiring, and there's nobody filling the gap. And the other one is in construction trades. Now, they're, they're different problems. Um, I think in the case of the engineering industry, what was we, one of the things I got heavily involved with was trying to revive apprenticeships and getting people, I mean, it's not just the kind of first stage apprenticeships, but up to level four, five, six, which are really the high skill degree equivalent. And we're beginning to build up a pipeline of that, but it's nothing like enough. Um, the way the British construction industry is organized, where you have these very big prime contractors, and they don't take responsibility for training. They basically leave it to their uh, tier one suppliers and subcontractors, and most of those guys are operating on a short-term time horizon, they're cash limited, so they don't train. So what, have, what happens is you get into a recession, training stops, um, and then when the re revival comes, there aren't people there to do the work. And we've been using immigration as a safety valve. Uh, that's essentially what's happened. And that valve will presumably not be there in future. Um, but I, I think everybody is now recognises, despite all the hype around immigration as an issue, we're just going to have to use it to, to meet skill requirements. 
And it's quite interesting that the table of issues that matter to the public, I don't know if you saw it yesterday, um, two years ago immigration was number one, it's now about number six, because as the economy is slowing down, what's happening is fewer people are coming in, more Europeans who are based here are leaving, more British people are leaving, looking for brighter hope, you know, things somewhere else. So net immigration is actually just coming down as the economy slows and it's less of an issue. Um, so all the excitement around we must deal with immigration even if it's at the expense of the economy is all looking terribly dated now. And the idea that you can jump out of the European Union and into some special arrangements with Commonwealth countries it really is an illusion. If you follow what's happened with Theresa May in India. It's a really interesting story. As soon as the Brexit vote was announced, she went off to India to ne begin the negotiation of a bilateral agreement. And she went again three months ago. And what happened on both occasions, she said, OK, which is what you just said, let's have a special arrangement with a former Commonwealth country that we're friendly with. And the Indians said, fine, what do you want? Uh, and uh, they, they said, well, you know, the British government would like to have better access to India for banking services and exporting whiskey. The latter didn't go down very well because the government are prohibitionists. But anyway, <laughs> we want better access for financial services. And they said, fine, OK, we'll, we'll talk about that. But of course, we want something in return. So she said, what do you want in return? We said, well, we'd like to have more visas, please, so that Indians can come and work in Britain as computer consultants or whatever, and students. Uh, to which she said, well, sorry, you know, we're trying to reduce net migration. We can't agree. So what they said to her was just get on your bike. Sorry, you know, if, <laughs> it's a two-way business. We're not colonies anymore, you know. And she was really sent packing. And, the, the other countries with which we would hope to have special agreements of that kind are no kinder. You know, they will, if, if you're a tough, important country like China, they will say, well, OK, you're a country of 60 million. There's this lot over here of 500 million. Who would we rather have dealings with? Well, you know, do the maths. And even Trump's trade advisor said the same. He uses a bit of American jar jargon. He says, we'd rather deal with bandwidth, what they mean. They'd rather deal with the big people, not the small people. So, I, I mean, the idea that there's some alternative set of trading arrangements. No, you know, you may export a few more tomatoes and so on from Zambia, and that would be good. But uh, that's not a way the world can be reorganized now. Well, I think it will only happen if public opinion radically changes, um, and there's quite a lot of evidence that it already is, people are beginning to see the problems, the costs mounting up, and are having second thoughts. I, I, we haven't yet got there, but I suspect that in a year, 18 months' time, um, a lot of people are looking for what I call an exit from Brexit, and that's actually the only way of doing it. Uh, so, is there any chance the Europeans will um, give a little bit more than they gave to David Cameron, which would potentially give some impetus to the um, revote campaign? I think one of the mysteries of modern history was why David Cameron's negotiations were so unsuccessful, mm. uh, because actually that's what lost the referendum, I Correct. think. Yeah. Uh, and he got a bit on benefits, but nothing at all on freedom of movement. And uh, I think some of the European governments were to blame for that. They should mm. have realised we had a real problem and should have helped with it. Um, uh, I, I don't know, because I'm not talking to them, but Tony Blair, who claims to be in and out of Prime Minister's offices every day, uh, claims there is a mood to be more flexible on that. Mm. And actually, when you look at the way the single market works in many European countries. They are pretty pragmatic. They're not, I mean, I've often explained that when I, I used to negotiate with the Germans about uh, services um, freedom, and you, you can't walk into Germany with a professional job unless you've got German qualifications. I mean, they don't allow unrestricted free movement. Uh, and I think if we approached it in that 
that way, a more educated it, approach. It, a more educated approach, it wouldn't be the same obstacle that it is at the moment. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I've got somebody in, waiting for me in Parliament at 10 o'clock. But anyway, thank, thank you.